Amen. Amen. We praise Jesus. Amen. You may take your seats. It is well. And I believe the children are dismissed to their Sunday school. If they want to go and have their class, if not, they can stay with me. Amen. And August is almost over. It's almost September. And can you believe that it took us four Sundays to study 25 verses <laughs> in the Bible? Amen. And uh, we're coming to a close. We're coming to the conclusion of the letter of Jude. And it's been such a short and powerful letter and an urgent letter for us, for the believers in that time and for us as well. And in this last segment of, of the letter of Jude, we will see how we as believers are to respond when we encounter those false teachings and especially false teachers. And during these last three Sundays, uh, We've seen how Jude has introduced that argument that we, as believers, need to contend for the faith, need to cont uh, defend, fight for the faith. And when he uses that word um, faith, um, he's also referring to the truth, to the veracity and the integrity of what the gospel means and that truth that Jesus introduced in the kingdom of God and that they could also find through the scripture. And he has brought images from the history of the people of Israel from Egypt all throughout, and then images from the prophets, images that were very familiar to them in that time. And those images were, were reflecting God's intolerance for sin. God does not tolerate um, sexual immorality, abuses of power, sin, when we have that desire to be recognized and put above God, all those things God does not tolerate, and Jude is telling us that he will come and judge those sin, sins. And now in the following verses, Jude wants to bring to the memory of the Jewish believers their current history. The, current, the, t the teachings that they just heard and that made them believe that Jesus was Lord, the teachings of the, of the apostles. So in verses 17 and 19, we read, But you, dear friends, remember the words spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the end times, in the end times scoffers will come living according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions. Since they don't have the spirit, they are worldly. So they don't have the spirit. We can see, clear, we can see a clear sequence of Jews' argument in this letter. As I say, he did the history, the prophets, and now he's bringing to their memory the current teachings that they were hearing from the apostles. And we can see these teachings. Thank you, Jesus, for the Bible, because we can see all those teachings in the New Testament. And in the book of Acts, Luke is um, saying how Paul was saying to the Ephesians. <laughs> so this is a saying from a saying. Um, in Acts 20, 29, and 30, I know that after my, this is Paul speaking, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you and won't spare the flock. Some of your own people will distort, change the word, in order to lure followers, lure followers after them. And Peter also warned about the same thing, 2 Peter 3, verse 3. Most important, know this. In the last days, scoffers will come, jeering, living by their own cravings. And then Jesus himself, in the Sermon of the Mount, he also said, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you dressed like sheep, but inside there are vicious wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Do people get bunches of grapes from thorny weeds, or do they get figs from thistles? So in other words, Jude is reminding us that 
through all the history of the people of Israel, through all the history of, huma of humanity, there will always be people that we hear the truth of the gospel and they can say, mm, I can benefit from this. I can take advantage of people and use this for my own benefit. And as believers, having that awareness that this is not something new and this is not something that will go away <laughs> until the second coming of Christ, having that awareness that there are people out there changing the truth of the gospel for their own benefit, it's, it's helpful because it, it gives us, it creates in us a posture of resilience and perseverance. It makes us aware that we need to be constantly studying scripture, gathering with believers, studying, chewing this up, learning, actively living this out, because if I don't do that, I might have doubts. I might, I might encounter people who will distort the truth, and I might fall in those changes. When Jude calls us to contain for the faith, he is calling us to defend that truth. And we have to know this truth that was conveyed in the life and in the ministry of Jesus, and then was taught by the apostle, written in scripture, and this has survived thousands of years. Miraculously, through wars, through intentionally wanting to destroy scripture, we can hold it today in our hands and read it and study it and know and be spoken by God every day through this. This is the truth of the gospel. And we can all agree that we live in a time where technology is very accessible, right? I remember, I, I, don't, I, I am not that old, right? But back home, <laughs> back home when a teacher will tell me, oh, you have this homework, you have to look information uh, from this uh, historical figure, what I will do is go to the library, right? <laughs> open up a book or talk to the librarian where I can find this information. I will open up a book and write with my pencil, right? And, and write all the information, you know? Write about when I was in middle school, internet was more accessible. They will bring computers into our school and teach us how to type. And, and you know, and then Google came. And now they say that this generation, it's, it's the generation that it's smarter than previous generations because of how much access they have. It doesn't mean they're wiser, <laughs> but they are smarter because they have more access to information and it's faster. And the downside of that is that because it's so accessible, it's easier to create new information that might or might not be ver verified <laughs> as true but if somebody famous will share it, then it must be true, right? <laughs> if a lot, if millions of people are reading that information and they say, oh, this, this sounds good, this must be true, I'm gonna share it. And the more people share it, then people believe, oh, this must be true, a lot of people are sharing this, right? So that's, that's the downside of all this access to information. And I, I remember a few months ago, my mom sent me this picture and, and, and for those of you who don't understand Spanish, it says, buy your land in heaven. Acquire your uh, square meter from $100. And, and then it, it, it has a scripture, Psalm, Psalm 73. 20. So if it has a scripture, it must be true because the Bible doesn't lie, right? And it's the church from the end times. So they're selling land on heaven, in heaven. That's what they're doing, right? And, you know, we see this and we think, how did they read the Bible and came up with some sort of fault, misunderstood the Bible in some way that they said, oh, we need to start buying land because it's going to run out or something like that. <laughs> you know, you know that what, right? Apparently, he take Google Pay and Apple Pay, right, and all the all the credit cards, and it's not God who's taking that, right? It's it's some other people on behalf of God, right? And you know, it sounds funny and almost absurd, but it's the reality, right? 
People are not misunderstanding by accident scripture. They are intentionally um, twisting the words of the Bible so they can take advantage of people and benefit their own wallets. And it's, unfortunately, it's not only money-wise, right? We've heard about sexual immorality within the church, priests, not only in the Protestant church, in the Catholic church, how there's so much sexual abuse. We've heard of financial corruption in churches. We've heard of how sin, uh, the sin of leaders, it's uh, sweep under the carpet. That's the say, right? So you won't affect the faith of the congregation, but then those people are still in power. <laughs> no accountability, no sort of what's going to happen with that person's spiritual being. We've heard of how congregants follow people instead of following God, right? We have so many uh, ways of misinterpret misinterpreting the scripture in order for people to take advantage of the innocence and maybe not, not merely innocence, but I, I like how Amy portrayed it last week, you know, when people want to hear something, right? And it's so easy to attain, then people are behind them trying to get advantage. And this just shows that no one is exempt from falling, from sinning. I am not exempt. The pastors are not exempt. The leaders are not exempt. Each one of us are in need of God. All of us need to be transformed by the truth of the gospel each and every day. How then can we respond to this reality that the truth of the gospel is in co constantly under attack and misuse, and that there are people who intentionally twist the truth of the gospel for their own benefit? And this is what Jude um, tells us to do, his exhortation in verses 20 to 21. But you, dear friends, build each other up on the foundation of your most holy faith, Pray in the Holy Spirit, keep each other in the love of God, wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will give you eternal life. I think the first observation I want you to pay attention to about this exhortation is the plurality of the vocabulary used this, used, used here. Jewish exhortations is not merely for an individual believer. It's for the community of faith, Right? And the second one, it's, I, I, I want, the second thing I want you to notice is that the call of how we respond to false teachings and false teachers, it's a proactive action within the community of faith and not a counterattack reactions to false teachers. So what that means is that when we encounter false teachers, instead of engaging in arguments or fights, Jude is inviting us to see how we are living the truth of the gospel. It is very improbable that a good thing will come when we engage with somebody that their main purpose is to cause division, right? They don't have the best interest of the gospel in their mind. So Jude is inviting us to see inward, not only individually, but also communally, right? Also as a community of faith. And Jude, um, uh, one of the ways that they cause division, it's by trying to change our focus from the truth of the gospel and inviting us to, to engage in things that are irrelevant for our salvation, right? Truth that the world said, oh, this is important and you need to pay attention to this. Things that might as well be important for our well-being and, and, and maybe for an interesting discussion, but are irrelevant for our salvation. And there are many, and there are many example, examples of this, how people try to uh, guide people's faith toward political things, toward social um, things to our educational things, how to raise your kids. Those things are definitely important, but when your main focus of how you live your life is that, that's a problem. 
What Judy is telling you right now is that we need to focus our attention into the truth of the gospel and how to live that truth, not only as an individual, but also as a community of faith. And he gives us three actions that will help us do this. Number one, build each other up on the foundation of your most holy faith. And this is where he brings the importance between the, uh, and the unity between the truth, that most holy faith, and the community of faith. That image of building one another, it's based on when we build uh, a structure, more like a temple. A temple that it's able to hold that most holy faith. But this action of building cannot be done in isolation. You've never seen a building being built by just one person, <laughs> right? It cannot be all by yourself. There is, of course, work that you do individually to strengthen your faith, to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, with God, those daily disciplines that we engage in. But we must not think that we need to wait for these kind of environments and gatherings and think that this is enough to strengthen our faith. What I want to say is that that one-on-one -on -one relationship that we, can, that we have with God cannot exist with the relationship that, you, that we have with God within the community of faith. They cannot be separated. You cannot be a Christian by yourself or a believer. I've, I've encountered people that say, yeah, I believe in God. I, I read the Bible. I do all these things, but I don't go to church, right? And that is a true argument that people believe that it's possible, right? But it's not. All the gospel, the truth of the gospel tell us that we cannot live in isolation from a community of faith. This gospel is to be shared. Our life is to be shared. Even outside of the gospel, nobody can live by themselves. <laughs> nobody can do life on their own. It is within the community of faith that the most holy faith, the truth of God, can maintain its integrity and can be protected from false interpretations. It is within the community of faith that we can see the truth of God transforming hearts. It is within the community of faith where we can see that the word is true, right? Because we can hear testimonies of how the word of God is changing hearts, it's changing lives, it's changing families, it's bringing people to salvation. It is within the community of faith that we can observe and, and know that this word of truth is alive and transforms lives. It is within the community of faith that we can find those safe spaces where the word of God is not used to abuse other people. It is not used for personal gain or to feed an individual's desire for power. Rather, it is within the community of faith that the word can sustain can reprove, can convince us of our sin, and holds us accountable to the holiness that God requires. And number two, pray in the Holy Spirit, keeping each other in the love of God. One of the things that Jude made clear is that these false teachers do not have the Holy Spirit. They can't. And the way we know this is by their fruit, by how they live their lives. And it is definitely easier to deceive an individual than to deceive a community, right? Because there are always people that are going to be, you know, there's different personalities in a community. There's personalities that accept everything at face value. But there's also personalities that say, wait a minute. You know, those personalities that want to question everything and, and argue about everything, sometimes for the sake of arguing. But how useful it is when they encounter false teachers, Right? Because it is those personalities that within the community that will help you question, right, those truths that come from outside the gospel. And this community had a Jew that will write to them very urgently. That messenger was running right, to say, these false teachers want to divide you, want to tell you something that is different want to normalize sexual abuse. They want to normalize those abuses of power. And you have to be brave and say, no, that's not true. That's wrong, right? And they also have the apostle who will write all these letters that we have in the New Testament saying things about false teachers, 
right? They have people in their community of faith that will help them understand what was the false teaching and what is the truth of the gospel. A few days ago, I heard on the radio a phrase that really um, shows this very clearly. That lady was saying, I will take care of you by keeping you in my prayers, right? And when Jude was saying, pray in the Holy Spirit, the power of prayer that we encounter within the community of faith, where the Holy Spirit is present and brings revelation to the church, to those moments when we're reading scripture together, that's how we keep each other in the love of God. That's how we take care of one another. And most of the time, that contending of the faith, that keeping each other accountable, that spiritual fight that we fight every day, the best way to do it is on our knees when we pray. Okay? Number three, wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will give you eternal life. And this is when Jude tries to shift their perspective from a worldly view into a kingdom of God view, an eternal view. As believers, we are not people who should focus our energy on earthly things, on things that are temporary, that will pass away. And of course, this includes those carnal desires, those that um, sexual immorality, those abuses of power. It also includes our lack of faith sometimes. It includes our doubts. It includes all the sin and temptation that we experience on earth. We are not to live our lives focusing on that, but rather on eternity, on the coming of Jesus Christ, on the kingdom of God that we are to represent while we are here on earth. That was the example that the false teachers were giving them. They were focusing on things that will give them immediate gratification because they thought that their lives will end. They had that perspective of, of a temporal life. But as believers, we're not to live like that because we're eternal beings, right? Our side is in heaven. We see life in a different way. And that's the way that Jesus taught the kingdom of God. And it is in Matthew 16, 24 and 27. Jesus said this. He said to his disciples, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves. Take up their cross and follow me. The opposite of gratification. All who want to save their lives will lose it. But all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why will people gain the whole world but lose their lives? Why will people give in exchange for their lives? For the human one is about to come with the majesty of his father with his angels, and then he will repay each one for what that person has done. And that is the mercy that we are waiting from Jesus. The day where all the injustice, all that sexual immorality, all those abuses of power, a day where all suffering, all sin, or sickness, all of the things that sin has created in this world, we're waiting for that day where Jesus will come and will erase all of that. He will eradicate and, most, uh, and, and he will redeem this world into that perfect image of Jesus. And whenever we are tempted to set our sight on the things that are of this earth or uh, on the things that are temporary, we must remember that we do not belong to this world. And that is be, because we belong to Jesus. We belong to a God that is constantly reminding us, remember eternity. Remember where you belong. Remember the truth that you have learned. We are to live as citizens of the kingdom of God Citizens who stand for the truth of the kingdom of God above any other truth this world has to offer. And this is where we need one another. This is when we need this community of faith. One of Satan's biggest lies is that we are enough. And you'll hear this, this a lot. 
We are enough. Just like you are, you are perfect. That is not what the Bible says. <laughs> that we can make it on our own. That we don't need anyone to be successful. That we don't need other people to define our truth. We must put our pride aside <laughs> when we believe those things. And recognize that we need God and we need other people to persevere in this walk of faith. This is how Jude ends this section in, in verses 22 and 23. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save some, listen to this, by snatching them from the fire. Fearing God, have mercy on some, hating even the clothing contaminated by their sinful urges. And the assumption that this verse is making is that there are people within the community of faith that are weak in their faith, that are having doubts in the truth of the gospel. People who are constantly struggling to trust that God's promises are true and that they can experience God in their daily life. People who are struggling daily with the temptation of sin. People who are struggling with thoughts that I don't belong here. I don't know, I don't know enough scripture. I'm too bad to be saved. There are people within every community of faith that are struggling with this. And the exhortation for the church is to have compassion. But the kind of compassion that fights. The kind of compassion that snatches them from the flames of judgment. That is what Jude is saying here. And I don't know if you've seen any fires going on and, and, and the firefighters going in. <laughs> but when you go into a fire, you might get burned. You might get full of, your, your hair smells like smoke. You might get dirty with ashes. And it might be hard to breathe. And you might get tired and scared. Right? And by this, I'm not saying that we are to join them into sinning or into despair. But by this, I mean that when we're snatching people from the flames of sin, of judgment, we are to walk with them in their struggle in their suffering. We are to be patient and compassionate in the times that they fall over and over and over and over again. Have you encountered people like this? That you walk with them and they fail. And you walk with them and they fail. And you walk with them and they're not growing. And you walk with them, right? Jude is calling us to have compassion and patience. Right? And the kind of compassion and persevering that we're talking here, when I was reading this, I was thinking about that image of Simon of Cyrene, that, the man that helped Jesus carry his cross. And the scripture tell, tells us that he was forced into helping Jesus. <laughs> it, it wasn't on his own volition that he went, okay, yeah, Jesus, hold on. I'll help you. The scripture tells us, no, he was forced by a Roman soldier to go and carry the cross with Jesus. And from that moment on, Simon of Cyrene, it's known as the vivid image of what it means to take the cross and follow Jesus. Right? So when we're persevering together in the faith and we're thinking about helping other people carry their cross, I'm not going to tell you it's going to feel good. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you it's not going to feel uncomfortable or that it's not going to hurt or that it might even feel forced. Because, of course, in every community of faith, you'll find people that are strong in their faith, that are mature believers, that are 100% in their spiritual disciplines, that are doing everything God is telling them that are reading their Bible, they're praying, they're serving, they're being obedient, and all of a sudden they encounter a person who is weak in their faith. And, and they will say, but do I have to? <laughs> How much involved do I want to be in carrying other person's crosses? It is not an easy choice because that means that your faith will be tested. 
and that carrying a cross, it's heavy, it's painful. You will suffer. But that's the calling God is making us today. That is the obedience that is required from a community of faith that really wants to um, be obedient to that word of being pers of persevering in the faith, of walking with one another. And one thing I will tell you, belonging to a community of faith that persevere together, that protects the, the, the truth of the gospel, that also means that when you are weak in your faith, that you, when you are struggling with doubt, you're telling me something, Jesus. <laughs> That when you're struggling in, in, in your faith, that when you're weak, that when you're having doubts, no matter how long you've been in the gospel, you can have the hope and the assurance that within the community of faith, you'll find a Simon of Serene. You'll find somebody that will help you carry your own cross. Because that's the image of the kingdom of God that Jesus introduced. A community of believers that take care of one another carrying each other's crosses, and being there for one another, persevering in the truth. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truth of the gospel. We thank you for the community of faith that you have given us. Because without this community, it will be very hard, Lord, to see you at work. It will be very hard to see the truth of the gospel right embody here on earth. We pray, Lord, for those who are struggling in their faith. We pray for those who are having doubts. We pray for those who are struggling to believe that you are faithful and that you do not fail. We pray for those who are struggling with temptation and sin. We pray for the hearts that are broken and the suffering that they're experiencing, Lord. We pray that as a community of faith, we can come alongside them, helping them to carry their crosses because that's the commandment that you have given us. I pray for those who are strong in their faith, that the, they will accept and take their, this call in obedience, Lord, and help others who are struggling. I pray that you will give us guidance and wisdom as to how to do that. And that above everything, we're able to persevere in the faith, persevere in the truth of the gospel, and always remember that you are with us, that your Holy Spirit will help us identify what is true from what is wrong, from what is false. And I pray that you will strengthen this community in this truth. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.